Edo, welcome to another edition of the No Choftes podcast. It's the Omonia Nicosia fan channel on the OLB. I'm your host as ever, Stel, and my guest host is potentially the next manager of the ethnic gear, Ian Birchall. Welcome to the show, Ian. Hey, Dean. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, all good. Great to have you on, mate. It's been a while since we actually spoke on a podcast. It is, yeah. It was a little while back now. Um, mm. Well, I can't even remember when the first one was. We we did uh, we've done a little one around some Europa League football, and uh, but we did one a quite a while back now with me, you, and Rodri. It was the top five games. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, it was lockdown five, one. Five, five games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been a little while. Mm, absolutely. How you been anyway? Good. Good. Yeah, just managing a bit of uh, work from home and home life for the kids on on lockdown. So three kids charging about the house, trying to put some semblance of organisation. It's probably harder organising them three kids than it is a, a national football team. So <laughs> it's, a good, uh, it's a good workout for me, that's for sure. Well, listen, mate, hopefully you, you'll be lucky and get this, this job with the Cypriot national team. But just for the benefit of our viewers, who is Ian Birchnell? Because I've spoken to several people, especially from the media in Cyprus, I said, look, just look at what he did at Ostersons and look at the managers that have been at Ostersons prior to Ian being there and see where they are now. And they're like, oh, oh, hold on. Yeah. Graham Potter, Brighton. So for a club like Ostersons to have you on board, must show you got some credentials there, mate. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, that was my most recent job and I followed Graham after the Europa League success. I went in there and, and uh, he went over to Swansea and then I took over the team and had two two seasons there or two and a bit seasons there. I left in the summer last year, you know, with COVID come in and a lot of things were changing within kind of football and personal life. So we came back to the UK. But prior to that, you know, the two years was were good. It was a bit of a transition period after the Europa League, but we had a really good season the, the first year, finishing up in the top six. So kind of mirroring what, what Graham and the team did the year before. And then we had a bit of a rebuild with a really, really young team. Uh, the next season but you know we acquitted ourselves well in the the top league over in Sweden prior to that I was I was five years in in Norway um, managing in a big club in in Viking Um, I was there for three years and prior to that two years in Sarpsborg in the top league so a lot of experience in in Scandinavia and prior to that I was working mainly in in youth football at Leeds United Bradford City so kind of my grounding was in youth academy and player development with the with the younger ones in the elite academies in, in those places. So been an interesting journey through kind of seeing different spectrums of, of the game. I've kind of worked up from grassroots through academy football right up to first team and management now. So it's been good. And then, you know, I'm in a position at the moment where I'm I'm between jobs, if you like, and waiting for the next step and seeing what that potentially is. And I've had some interesting dialogues we're in different places, really, and, and kind of waiting for whatever I feel is is the right next step. So the good thing is, in this current climate, you are actually kind of sport for choice, aren't you? You, as you said, you've been given several offers. It's just about picking the right one, what's best for you, and obviously for the family. Yeah, it is. It's a it's a little bit about the family, you know, with the kids getting a little bit older and getting them some again semblance of stability, really, because we we've, we've kind of travelled a lot around now, so. You know, the different, offer. I mean, as soon as I left Oster, some of some interesting offers, but nothing that I really felt was going to be the right next thing for me. Um, yeah, and, and had some some good dialogues. I was in in talks and, and I guess it's public domain knowledge now, but I was in uh, shortlisted and in public talks with um, uh, the Icelandic national teams. So, you know, I've kind of looked into to national team football and the possibility of coaching on a international level which of course is is really interesting so the Icelandic national team was was good to be kind of considered and shortlisted for that and and it was really really interesting going through that process with them and kind of gave me that interest to to look more as well into kind of national team level level football. Mm. Well forgive me for sounding like I'm conducting a a job interview here but (laughs) yeah but why Cyprus? Do you know what we um we, I actually went there in pre-season a couple of years ago and we, we I mean, for one, we, we enjoyed ourselves when we were there, that, that's for sure. We had uh, really fantastic training facilities and, and got a really good impression when, when we were over there. But at the same time, I watched a couple of league games when I was there um, 
in different teams. We watched uh, Larnaca and we watched Nia Salamina. And uh, do you know what? I was surprised surprised at, at how good the quality was in the league, which maybe I hadn't, hadn't sat, I can't say I sat in Scandinavia and watched the league. So I, I looked into it and then I've kind of, you know, we, you pick up as a coach, you go and watch a game and you look at the tactics and the players and some of the individuals. And then you kind of like follow some of them, especially when you go then into European stages and seeing some of the Cypriot teams play on a European level, then you kind of follow it even a little bit more. So I went there and, and realised that the quality was very good. Um, uh, talented players, both, you know, there was quite, the games I watched was a big Spanish influence and you could see that from the, the style of football, but it was technical. Um, and the Cypriot players there were also very good uh, technical players. And you could see that the influence of different nationalities that were there, there was Brazilians, um, Portuguese, Spanish, of course, like a couple of English players. And, and I think such a, a blend of nationalities playing in one league often will influence the brand of, uh, of play and the quality of the Cypriot players. So they will actually become broader with their tactical knowledge because they get influenced from all these different uh, cultures. So for me, it was quite an interesting one because it's, it's a, when you look at the league, it's a very diverse league in terms of like the demographic of players. And you can see that there's quality there as well and something that you can genuinely work with. And, you know, the, of course, the, the, the team hasn't qualified for major tournaments before. So if you're able to, to get that step closer to it and, and try and achieve that goal, I think that you can really um, kind of stamp your name on, on uh, football at international level. Oh, absolutely, mate. And, and you know, when I found out that you were interested in the job itself, knowing you, knowing your career in youth development and what you did for Ostersunds, especially in, in Norway as well, the first thing I thought was, wow, you know, Valem was in charge of the Cypriot national team. He had such a uh, long history of, of uh, coaching players, especially at under-21 level for the Belgian national team. And, you know, youth fit like a glove. I look at the, the current squad and the average age has gone down to 24 years old, which is phenomenal. You know, yeah. Cyprus is constantly producing players. And as an Omonia fan, I'm not ashamed to admit it, our academy has, has been thriving, especially this season. We brought through Johnny's, who's now 19 years old, uh, Lois, who's 17 years old. These two play for the national team regularly. Gagwili's up front. Uh, we got Gusulos, we signed a couple of seasons back at 24 years old. Um, a goalkeeper, you know, Giragidi is at 22 years old. He's the second choice for the national team. But the thing is, when you look at the rest of the squad, again, you're looking at players at 25 years old, Bitter at 24 years old, at Abolon. And there's so much potential in the squad. I mean, one of our players is on loan at Frosinone from Juventus, Castanos. Yeah. So, yeah. again, we've, we've got the core group of players, but we just need, A, patience from the federation for the next guy that comes in and a guy that knows how to cope with youngsters because make no bones about it. Granted, there are some youngsters who are a bit up their own backsides, but they need someone to, to t knock them down a few pegs. But... You know, you're used to seeing big personalities at youth level, right? Yeah, I've worked, yeah, I've worked with some big talents at youth level and, and kind of, you know, even in the clubs that I've been in, in in Scandinavia, one of the things that you have to do is you have to bring in young players, develop them and, and sell them on because that was a model that a lot of the clubs need for sustainability. And so kind of working in an environment which is developing young players, improving knowledge and... and not only that, but, you know, in, uh, if you consider in a national team level, to be able to influence cultures and training culture and knowledge, not just in your team, but generally through the federation. And that's something that is, is of course, really interesting because as a head coach, I see myself when, when you're a head coach, like when I'm a head coach in, in Viking, for example, big club with a very good academy um, out in Norway there my role was to be the head coach but it's also to try to implement and create cultures that resonate through the club and then you've got to do the same if you're in a in a federation because the next wave have got to be as a result of some of the things that you begin to implement so i think it's 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 really interesting and, and it you know of course flattering to be connected with with the role because it's um you know any time that you connected with a role especially one as significant as that for a, for a country, then it's um, 
you know, very flattering and, and, and always one that you take seriously with, with a lot of interest. So, um, you know, I've, uh, like I say, you know, we had a chat about it and, uh, and it's something that I've looked into and, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll obviously see where, where it goes. That's great, mate. And another thing I need to ask you, um, as I mentioned before, that the squad is relatively young, um, yeah. but then there are still a lot of experienced players out there. I'll give you an example for this bubble. Liz, that's at 36 years old, joined Omonia, yeah. joined us at the beginning of the season. He's been absolutely incredible domestically and in the Europa League. He was fantastic, yeah. especially in the Champions League qualifier against uh, Red Star Belgrade. Outstanding. Um, and I think he, he's been the consummate pro, but he's also that talking uh, captain-like uh, personality where he can yeah. speak to the youngsters, etc. Do you think it's vital to mix uh, older players with youth players? Because to be fair, in terms of a, a quality pool of experienced players in Cyprus, I don't think it's as good as the quality of the youngsters. Do you know what? It, I often think it depends on the, the individual as well, because... You need to you need to have those ones that can create positive influences on the on the younger players. They can you can draw on their experience of being in certain games, and you know they've been through certain situations before. It can be during games, can be in terms of like travel preparation, uh, mindset, and I think using the experienced players to draw on them to to help the younger players along and lean on them. But what you don't want is for them to be frustrated or a burden or um, feeling like their time's running out and they become uh, counterproductive to the to the team so you need to know that the if you're going to have a young team the older ones that are in there are kind of influencing they understand their role they understand their role on and off the pitch and are positive from that perspective um, because if the aim is to to push and develop the younger ones you, you hope that the, the older ones that you have in there are really like you know on board with the that as a, a concept for a, for a, whether it's a national team or even at club level, it's the, the same principle applies really. Mm, absolutely, mate. And um, when it comes to youth development and blooding youngsters, yeah, how how close would you like to work? I mean, if you were to get the job, how closely would you like to work with the the clubs? Not only in the in the top division in Cyprus, but also in the second division in terms of looking at their youngsters and players that perhaps haven't been given an opportunity in the past by previous managers. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I think it's about, um, you know, roles like this would be about um, building solid networks and platforms with, and, you know, it's a, a small island, so it's, you know, very easy to be about and, and to, to create good links and good relationships so that you can monitor, that you can put in structure for young players so that they get the right um, messages. I think it's important that the that any any federation again the same as same in club football has a uh, deliberate identity that it wants to 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 drive forward and then when you've got that you can go out and you can watch young players with those reference points and through the eyes of what you want to see when uh, you bring a national team together so i think it's really important to to be open with the with the clubs to to monitor the development of the younger players and and to see if you can assist in them uh, breaking through and progressing, so that the you know the the stream of players is a is a good and constant one. And I think when you're looking in general, you know, I looked in, I looked at did you know when I was uh, before when when I was uh, speaking with the Icelandic national team about the role there, I looked a lot into like cap accumulation and um, you know how many. So you take England for example, when England went to the last World Cup. I think their accumulated load of caps was, I think, 50% lower than some of the other nations succeeding, like France and, and countries like that. And that's be, and there's like an optimal amount of caps that players can have before they're considered kind of experienced at an international level. So ensuring that young players are accumulating caps in the right environment and developing that cap accumulation so you're gaining that valuable uh, international experience is really, really important. Um, you know, so I think you see it now with the England national team that young players have sometimes got chances and people are like, well, hang on a minute. You know, they've not played that many games for their respective club, but they've done their, their, they've done their time with the under-21s and now they're trying to 
on an international level build up that experience so when it comes to major tournaments they've accumulated more international experience on a broader level and i think that's important for the young ones coming through that that um that those caps are accumulated and experience is gained because when you get into towards tournament football it's it's crucial that you're you're not too sure on that kind of level of experience i i agree mate in terms of a, a pool of talent um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, um, you know, back in 1974, there was a, a the Turkish invasion of Cyprus led to hundreds of thousands of Cypriots fleeing the, the island and becoming yeah. refugees. My mum so happens to be one of yeah. them. And she came out here when she was 18 and I was born out here. But the same applies to, to millions of other Cypriots across the world. Yeah. In, in America, in Australia, we've seen Cypriots of Australian uh, birth play in the A-League. Now, yeah you get in the separate national team job, you will have the opportunity to see players in, in possibly USL, MLS, North yeah. Canada, or the Canadian Premier League, shall I say, even the A-League and especially the UK. Now, you know, we've seen the likes of uh, Harry Kiprianu at Southend, uh, Jack Rolles, who's at Spurs. Yeah. Um, who else? Oh, Tarula that scored for Quali Town against Leeds the other week yeah. in the FA Cup. I don't know if you saw yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I did, yeah. yeah. There you go. And then... Fantastic. Yeah. And, and also Marcus Edwards, who's at yeah. Vitor Guimaraes at yeah, the moment yeah. in, in Portugal, half Cypriot. Yeah. And yeah. I, I look at someone like, for example, Andros Townsend. And look, don't get me wrong. Troy Townsend and I, we've known each other for a long time. And I've never actually asked him, Troy, do you know how much of a legend Andros would be in Cyprus if you'd have chosen yeah. Cyprus over England? And I think, you know, as I said, if you do get the opportunity, I hope you take the... The, how can I put it, take the initiative like Anastasiades did a few years ago by looking outside of Cyprus because the previous head coaches, they haven't really made the effort, in my yeah. opinion, anyway. It's only yeah. really Valen that's done it, but at the same time, the players like, you know, Laifis was already in Belgium, so he knew about him. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's dual nationality is a, a massive window to get players that have got maybe grown up as well in like you say, different countries, different cultural experiences, different football experiences, and they can be really important to building what you want to build. And there are some really talented players that um, that are possible to get as well. So I think that, that dual nationality and things like that, although I have to tell you that I don't know that you'd be concerned. I thought that you were going to pitch yourself that you were still capable of playing at one point there. <laughs> no, 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 no. My playing days are done, but believe me. I could just about do five-a-side these days, mate. You know, but yeah. if, if, if you need a translator or a, yeah, a, yeah. a, a performance analyst or something... You know. Yeah, then you... <laughs> yeah. No, it's... Uh, but, but like you say, uh, you know, with... Um, you know, with, with the conflict that happened, many left and, and that... As, but that in, in itself has kind of created a window or globally where, where Cypriot players, young Cypriot players are, uh, are popping up and the potential to kind of tap into that market is, is very, very interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, like I said earlier, you know, it's uh, extremely flattering and, and, you know, nice to be linked with, with national team roles and, and, and certainly one that I've, I've explored and looked into and, and uh, you know, hopefully hear a little bit more about it in the, the coming weeks. Well, uh, one more thing before we wrap it up, because I know that you've got a lot of things going on at the moment. Everything's on Zoom. I have to wait until the kids get to bed and then I, then I get an opportunity to jump on these calls when I've got peace and quiet. Mate. You know oh, exactly how it is, yeah. Oh, mate. Is it, and do you know what? To be honest, it, having children is an absolute blessing, but sometimes you just want to say to them, off, oh, just come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave me alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just for just for five minutes, will do. Yeah, yeah, that's just five minutes. Yeah. Just so I can put my feet. I don't want to hear daddy. No, 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 no. Just, just no. <laughs> yeah. I bought you a Nintendo yeah. Switch. Go play with it. <laughs> you see, I'm in the I'm, I'm in the dark here, just so I can't get found by the kids because <laughs> they're that's, scared of the dark, so they don't want to come down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good thing I'm gonna try that next yeah, time. Yeah, you see. <laughs> well, look, put this way. The, the final question is, you know, if you were to get the job, you'd be the first British. Uh, coach uh, of the Super National team since Ray Wood in 1970, I believe, 71. And, you know, over the past, I say, many years, we've had Mike Walker coaching at Abuel, Mick McCarthy at the, the same yeah. club. Uh, players out, out there, not just Matt Derbyshire, yeah, but players, going yeah. further back, we've seen Chris Bart Williams, we've seen Craig yeah. Hignett, we've seen yeah. many footballers and, and all that. But if you were to get the, the Cypriot National team job, um, 
what, what are we talking about here in terms of a, a playing style? Are we are we talking about you know uh, attack minded football? Are results the main thing, or is it is it development that's key for you? Obviously, it's a results industry, but yeah. what, what would be your I don't know your your philosophy or your your targets? I mean, you know, I've always considered myself somebody that wants to play quite open, expansive attacking football, but I'm also aware that you know when you're talking about international football, you're talking about uh, coming up against teams like Croatia, for example. And when you're talking about that, to be too open and expansive can also quickly become naive. So it's kind of bridging the gap between understanding, improving on the, um, you know, the, the outlook from a attacking perspective. So believing that you're capable of doing it, creating like a brave game model that, that, it is, you know what, and, and having young players is very good for that because young players have, tend to be quite fearless when they come in um, and, and maybe think a bit less sometimes than uh, some of these more senior players that have been around the block and played against these teams before. So they get, they've got that kind of fearlessness in them. So trying to, to, to play braver uh, football, I would say, than maybe what you would expect when you come up against some of the, the big hitters would be really interesting to see. But at the same time, you know, you've got to, to respect the quality of the, the teams that you play against. You're going to play against world, world-class world players, you know, top, top uh, players from across Europe. And then you have to respect that also and, and understand the right moments to, to be brave and, and expansive and the right time when you've got to, to try and close and, and do the best result that you can. So definitely, you know, I, I have a positive... Um, outlook in terms of how how the game should be played and then implementing it you know is is also opposition driven um you know it depends on who you're playing against but but certainly you know i would i would be doing my best to try to play a, a brand of football that was interesting and, and forward thinking well ian thank you very much for your time mate really appreciate it. and um you know I, I wish you luck you know and even if you don't get the job i i hope you find the the right role that is there for you um you know hey listen as, as a person that I've known for about a year, year and a half. I yeah. really hope you get the, the national team job uh, for Cyprus. We, we need someone with new ideas, fresh ideas, and uh, someone with your experience completely fits the bill. And uh, good luck with that, mate. Yeah. Top man. Good speech. Thank you very much. Cheers. Well, Cheers look, See you, mate. that's it for another episode. We'll be back very soon. I'm just about to drop the interview with uh, Sofiane Shefra, the first part, which, God, the whole podcast went on for almost two hours. But yeah, <laughs> whenever you guys watch it, Leave a comment. Same with this one. Like, share, subscribe. Tell your nunna. So until next time, take care.